Welcome to Redbeard and the Den of Tools. Howdy ho guys and gals, I'm Red, your friendly neighborhood tool bear. And today we're going to go over a brief history of the Milwaukee Electric Tool Company. Yeah, we're going to need to roll the clock back to 1922, just three short years after the end of the Great War, WW1. And believe it or not, the beginnings of this tool company start with none other than the great Henry Ford. Yep, Ford, despite all his success, is now feeling pressure from hiring companies like Cadillac. His response to this is to go out and buy Lincoln. I mean, that's one way of doing it, right? But his assembly line process, it, it's designed to pump out cars for the people. It's designed to turn them out, all right? But it isn't designed to produce high-end refined vehicles like the Cadillacs and the Lincolns. So Henry needs to retool. He needs, he needs to figure out what his guys need to be able to make these better quality vehicles. And what they need are better tools. Tools that are lighter, stronger, and that will allow them to be more precise and to be able to basically do more with less. So Ford looks around and he he, uh, he decides to talk to the A.H. Peterson Company, one of Ford's tool and die suppliers, and he has a really good working relationship with Ford. Ford, you know, being the genius that he is, can spot the genius in another guy, and goes to Peterson saying, hey, here's what I need. I need a, a new type of drill. I need one that is stronger, that's more precise. Oh, and it has to be light enough to be operated single-handed, which back then was a big issue. Peterson, you know, engineering genius that he is, is ready to rise to this challenge. And his answer to Ford's dilemma is the hole shooter. I, I kid you not. That's, that's what it's called. <laughs> it is the world's first single-handed quarter-inch capacity drill. I know, you look at this and you're like, that, that's a drill. Looks more like Flash Gordon's blaster or something. And and also you look at it, My you know, even my first impression is that doesn't look lightweight, you know, when you compare it with today's modern, you know, micro drills and such. But the fact is, compared to what was out at the time, yeah, <laughs> it's a good deal lighter. And with the hole shooter, Ford's techs no longer had to double up on a lot of their jobs. Previously, you had to have one guy holding the tool and one guy holding the workpiece. Now you could have the tool in one hand, the workpiece in the other. It was definitely the right tool for the job, and with Ford's success dependent on his tools, it seemed like Peterson's own success was guaranteed. But then disaster struck. Peterson's future went up in smoke when a massive fire destroyed his factory. Ugh. Oh. With the loss of the factory, that meant no production. No production meant no Ford sales, and with no sales, the company was soon forced to close its doors. Shortly afterwards, the company and all its assets were put up for auction. But all was not lost. The entire company was scooped up by Mr. A.F. Siebert. Yeah, Peterson's former partner, no less. Siebert then founded the Milwaukee Tool Corporation, now, I'm not saying that Siebert set the Peterson factory on fire. I'm not saying he did. Anyway, now with the new company up and running, Milwaukee's new hole shooter was dominating the market, but soon copycats rushed to market as well, trying to elbow in on the lucrative new single-handed drill market. <laughs> But Siebert used his connections at Ford to get feedback from techs right on the line to update the drill design consistently, keeping it ahead of the market for years. In 1935, Milwaukee introduced a three-quarter inch lightweight flamethrower. I mean, hammer drill. <laughs> I mean, come on, look at it. It looks like a flamethrower to me. Anyway... Primarily designed for, you know, hammer drill type, you know, work like setting anchors and such. Uh, it also took advantage of the lightweight designs used in the hole shooter. And as such, it became a huge hit, but not really as a hammer drill. Instead, people were converting it to run as a straight three quarter inch drill. Just like the hole shooter was taking over the quarter inch business. This new hammer drill took over all of the three-quarter inch business. Needless to say, at this time, Milwaukee had cornered the market on state-of-the-art, lightweight, single-handed drills. Fast forward to 1949, and Milwaukee is targeting more people in the trades, specifically electricians and plumbers. 
they released their first right angle drill. This is a theme that the company has followed to this day. That is, specifically going after niche trademark and showing that this is a true professional grade tool. In 1951, they released one of their most iconic tools ever, the Sawzall. Built as an electric hacksaw, it has all of three moving parts, making it slightly less durable than, say, oh, I don't know, a Sherman tank. And this quickly became one of the, you know, must-have tools for every job site. You could drop it off the top of a building, pick it up, and it'd probably still keep working. In 1970, again, they showed that they understood and supported the needs of the modern tradesmen. They released the Whole Hog High Torque Drill, designed to easily drill holes in joists and studs. It quickly became another must-have tool. I mean, look at that thing. It ain't pretty. It looks like a, a beast of a tool. How's it going to work? But it's specifically designed to fit in the standard gap that you saw between joists, getting as much power as possible into those spaces. The 70s and 80s got a bit crazy for the company. In 1975, they were sold to Amstar. Yeah, don't feel bad if you don't know who they are, but you probably recognize their signature product, a.k.a. Domino Sugar. Now, why did a sugar company buy a, a tool company? Well... We don't know specifically, but I'm pretty sure they were on some sort of sugar high. And we're like, dude, we, we, should, we should totally buy a tool company. Lord only knows what got them to make that decision. But in 1979, Milwaukee comes out with the first U.S. made four and a half inch angle grinder. Now you may be asking, you know, why is this so important? Well, angle grinders, for those of you who don't know, it's one of the most important tools in the welding profession. <laughs> or as I like to joke, I'm not much of a welder, but I can sure grind with the best of them. In 1983, Amstar sold the brand off to Kohlberg Kravis Roberts, otherwise known as KKR. Now, if you thought you were confused about Amstar, don't feel bad at all if you don't know who KKR is. KKR is, wow, how do you say this? They are the, that typical scourge of, of business. They're one of these companies that buys up assets figures out what's profitable or not, tears them apart, sells off the profitable ones, takes a loss, quote unquote, on on the part that isn't profitable. And and really that's what they do. They go and they find value and they rebrand it, market it, and sell it off. And as such, KKR didn't hold on to the brand for long. Three years later in 1986, they were sold to, <laughs> I can't believe I'm saying this. They were sold to Merrill Lynch, the bull of Wall Street. Again, this comes down to a larger company trying to diversify their portfolio. It was the 80s, and for those of you who weren't there, oh, the stock market was going crazy, and everyone was buying anything they could get their hands on because everyone was making money. It, it's just the crazy 80s that they were. But Merrill Lynch held on to them for a little longer than KKR managed to, and in 1991, Milwaukee released the Super Sawzall. Okay, that doesn't look right. There, that's that's better. The Super Sawzall. Now, this is about the time when the bear got into the trades and I was working on houses. Maybe some of you guys have heard the story I talked about before where I once cut an entire house in half with a Sawzall. And, and to be honest, it was a Super Sawzall. But that's the thing about these tools. With the foot on it firmly planted and a good blade in it, you let the tool do its work and essentially a Sawzall can cut through Pretty much anything, given the you know, given enough time. In 1995, Merrill Lynch sold off the brand to Atlas Copco. Atlas Copco, a Swedish-based tool company and owner of AEG Tools in Europe, they wanted to get into the U.S. market, and much like Ford back in the day when he wanted to do something, rather than starting from the ground up, he just went out and bought Lincoln. Well, they just went out and bought Milwaukee. And what do you know? Boom! Instant market share. Fast forward 10 years to 2005 and Atlas sells Milwaukee and AEG as a package deal to TTI, otherwise known as Tektronic Industries, for a cool $626.6 million, as well as them assuming another $86.2 million in pension obligations. Now, TTI owns many other well-known brands, such as Ryobi, Homelite, Dirt Devil, and Vax. They also manufacture the rigid line of tools under contract for Emerson. No, that that that's that's AEG. Oh, there we go. <laughs> rigid. How how could I ever mistake the two? 
This acquisition makes TTI the second largest tool company behind Stanley Black & Decker. TTI did not wait long to make some significant changes. Their first move was to revolutionize Milwaukee's tool line and offer the first power tool line with lithium ion battery tech. Yeah, they're the guys who push that envelope on batteries for power tools. While this was designed to appeal mostly to the higher end professional market with their V28 batteries, it quickly became apparent that with this new tech, the capacity and power of lithium could also reinvigorate the 18 volt NICAD battery tool lines. Over the next four years, Milwaukee again shows their dedication to supporting the trades by developing a complete line of tools targeting construction, electrical, plumbing, and maintenance. They even went further by going after less served niches like HVAC slash R, MRO, mechanical, and even the remodeling market. In 2008, Milwaukee saw an opportunity to get into the hand tool market and acquired the Stiletto Tool Company, the leading seller of titanium hammers. In other news, apparently titanium hammers are a thing. <laughs> I'll be honest, I'd never run across them. Apparently, I'm not high fluting enough for them titanium hammers. Uh, I did some looking into it, and I, I thought it seemed odd myself because, you know, the ha titanium hammer would be lighter, and most of them seem to use a sort of skeletonized frame, making them lighter again. But apparently, there's a market for this sort of thing. They look pretty damn cool to me. I don't know if any of you have had any experience with titanium hammers. Uh, leave a comment below and educate the bear on what you think about them. In 2013, Milwaukee launches their M18 fuel system that combines their three proprietary technologies, Power State brushless motors, the Red Lithium battery packs, and Red Link Plus, which is essentially an onboard self-diagnostic system that can monitor and control the energy being released by the battery on the fly based on the work and condition of the tool, the battery, and the environment. It helps keep the batteries cooler, the tool cooler, run longer, and work harder. And by all accounts, it's been an incredible success. In 2014, Milwaukee doesn't stop there and they acquire Empire Levels, what, it, what many consider to be the, the top of the line in uh, the level industry. And that brings us into the modern days of Milwaukee Tool. Now, TTI, the parent company, is based out of Hong Kong. But don't think of them as your traditional Chinese manufactured kind of company. They are truly an, international, uh, an internationally run company with commitments to working and providing jobs in the States. In the last couple of years, Milwaukee Tool announced that they plan to expand their U.S.-based operations dramatically at both their Wisconsin and Mississippi locations. They've promised to spend over $33 million on facilities and the creation of over 1,000 new jobs over the next three to four years. And more and more tools are getting badged with that sort of built-in-America type of slogan, similar to DeWalt's Made in the U.S. from Internationally Sourced Parts. It's not perfect, no. But it's a step in the right direction in bringing manufacturing back to the states. And Milwaukee's led the charge in this through one through with their major shift towards cordless technology. They, in fact, own the number one spot for market share for cordless power tools in the U.S. Steve Richmond, Milwaukee's president, said, hey, and, and you're going to love this, we don't design products for do-it-yourselfers. Now, a lot of passionate do-it-yourselfers may want a product that performs, but we design products for those professionals and those professional trades. I'm not sure whether a statement like that is the PR equivalent of shooting yourself in the foot or PR gold because you're either telling DIYers that we don't care about you or you're playing hard to get and saying, well, we only make the best quality tools. We're not for DIYers, which of course, when you tell somebody they can't have it is the quickest way to make somebody go, well, that's what I need. I want it. I must have it. And in keeping with their professional only uh, mantra, Milwaukee tools are not sold in most of the stores you'd associate with homeowners and DIY. In fact, they have an exclusive partnership with Home Depot, meaning that they are not sold in Lowe's, Menards, or on Amazon.com. Now, you may find the tools on Amazon, but they're not being sold through one of their you know main distribution channels just because somebody else buys it and then turns around and lists it, they can do that, but that's not Milwaukee themselves selling it. So where does that leave us today? Well, 
Milwaukee by far is, I have to admit, one of my favorite brands. Now, it's not a brand I currently own much of anything. I think I have a old semi-vintage Sawzall in moderately working condition. Okay, it works, but it has no foot on it. It needs a, to get the foot replaced. But the fact of the matter is, when it comes to your basic power tools, the bear usually recommends rigid, because I am a DIYer these days. I'm not working in the trades. But I will tell you, you know, you go to any Home Depot and such, and you look at those new micro, what they call micro drills, the, the new ultra tiny, ultra powerful drills, and you just, you can't beat them. And look at Milwaukee's M18 fuel line. You know, I know we looked at DeWalt recently, and we talked about the flex volt system that they have powering, you know, tools like table saws and, uh, and, sli and, and miter saws. But you know what? Milwaukee's there too, and they're not using a high voltage system for it. They're using their 18 volt system to power table saws like this. And miter saws like this. I don't know what more I can tell you. Milwaukee is doing more with less. And every guy that I talk to who's a serious, hardcore, in the trades kind of guy, no one has anything bad to say about Milwaukee. Milwaukee has better warranties. They're more positioned in the more niche trades. And as they said themselves, we're not looking at the DIY market. We're professionals only. Well, there you have it. Tell us what you think in the comments below. Are you a Milwaukee fan? Are you a DeWalt fan? Ryobi? You know, whichever you like, though. Just remember that even though they may not reflect the tools quite of years past and they've, they've changed ownership and stuff, look at where the tool is today. Look at what the company is doing. You know, are they putting jobs in the States and stuff like that? And then, you know, also decide, does it fit your pocketbook? Is this the right tool for you? And then make the decision that works best for you. You know, don't make it based off of what anyone tells you, even if he is a incredibly handsome and gorgeous talking bear. Remember, you're the one who has to live with the tool. So make the right choice that works for you. All right, there you go. There's your brief history of Milwaukee tools. Hope you enjoyed it. Take care, everyone. Be sure to like and subscribe. Ring that bell. Check out some of our other videos. If you haven't seen the brief history of the DeWalt or the decline of Sears, check those videos out. And as always, remember, shine on. Thanks for watching the video. If you'd like to help support the channel, the easiest way is our one, two, three method. First, chomp that like button, give us a thumbs up, spread the word with a share, and subscribe and ring the bell. Remember, if you don't ring the bell, YouTube doesn't really believe that you want to watch the videos. But maybe you'd like to take it a step further. Maybe you want to go over to Patreon and consider subscribing to the channel. For only a dollar a month, you can become a Black Bear member and help support the Den of Tools. Also, YouTube now allows us to sell merch directly on each video. Yeah, if you scroll down below the video, right where you see the description, right below that, you should start seeing a little pop-up window that shows you some of the Denna Tools merch. Or pick up a copy of the Home Distiller's Workbook, your guide to making moonshine, whiskey, vodka, rum, and so much more. And we still have the DeBear shirts available. Links to those items, as always, are in the description below.